So welcome all to the session of the Media Education Lab's AI in the Classroom series. As we go through today's conversation, lots of you are already familiar. Please introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, use the chat as a way to ask questions, engage with other people, and of course, ask questions, participate in the discussion. You can also use the raise hand function, and we welcome you to join on camera and off mute during the interactive portions of the session as well. So in this session, we're going to talk about how we can develop our own AI literacy as educators and how we can do that for our students as well. And Professor Mahabali is our guide for this discussion. Among the many, many things on your CV and resume, you're also the professor of practice for the, at the Center of Learning and Teaching at the American University in Cairo. And I could probably use the rest of this session to talk all about the work that you do, but I will let you take it away and introduce yourself and start our session. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. I like to start by saying assalamu alaikum. It means peace be upon you. And it works for any time of day. So it doesn't matter what your time zone is. It also means hi and bye. So it can work at the beginning, at the end of everything. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I hear from Jocelyn that this is an interactive bunch, which is great because my sessions are always interactive. I never assume that I know more than everyone else in the room and definitely the collective of the room knows more than me. And so I'm really, really happy to listen to what you've all got to say while I'm talking, but I'll also pause and ask you to, to share things um, in the chat as we go. And I'm also happy for people who want to unmute. To, I think there's a lot of us, so maybe raise hands and, and then we can call on you. And of course, um, if Jocelyn notices something in the chat or that someone's hand is raised, if I'm like too busy talking, I don't notice. Um, all right. So uh, as she said, I'm Habedi from the American University in Cairo. I'm also part of a lot of uh, other grassroots movements like Equity Unbound and Virtually Connecting, a little bit of that will come up later. And I'm Bali underscore Maha on Twitter. Um, if you want to tweet any of these slides, they're Creative Commons non-commercial license. So I'm gonna put the link to my slides right now. They're open for commenting. So even after this session, if you feel like you wanna go back to something and leave me a comment, you can do that. You can also reuse parts of them as long as you attribute them to me and you don't sell them. And you can screenshot them and post them on social media, whatever, whatever works for you. Um, and these are the slides again. And my first question is always, how are you feeling today? And um, if you want to, as I see some people have said where they're from, if you haven't done that yet, also tell me like how you're feeling and where you are in the world right now. I know we have people from a lot of countries because I know a few people here. So I can already see Italy, India, lots of folks from the US, Malaysia. All right, so I'll wait to hear in the chat how you guys are feeling. I am excited to be with you all. I'm slightly frazzled because I just got home like 15 minutes ago, but we're good. I'm glad I'm home and not in the car, so that's good. Feeling hot, Natasha? It's, it's I think, hotter here. It's closer to, it's 40-something degrees, which is 100 and something in Fahrenheit. So it's really hot here. I don't know how hot it is where you are. Uh, Troy is grateful to be here and listen. Some people are excited, a bit overwhelmed with deadlines. I see. Why do you have so many deadlines in, in the summer? <laughs> uh, maybe summer courses. Um, happy to be learning. Monterey, feeling great and happy to be learning. Drenched, okay. So it's raining, I'm guessing, where you are. Or drenched from the heat, from sweat. That could work too. Okay, so, so that's just feeling hot, but it's not that hot. Okay. Oh, you're in Brazil, Mariana. Happy to be here. Chemicals, sure thing, no problem. Enjoy your lunch. Uh, hot and humid in Ohio. Happy to learn in a heat wave. <laughs> Everybody's got a heat wave, except I guess the Southern Hemisphere. So maybe in Brazil, it's colder. Um, basing syllabi rewrites, Joyce. Oh, could be exciting, I guess. Depends who you're rewriting them with on your own, with students, with colleagues. Uh, Jocelyn, feeling happy to be inside in DC. Excited to see so many familiar names. Shout out to SIDL23 folks. Thank you all for sharing how you're feeling. And this is a question I really enjoy sharing. Uh, and I'll, I'll just um, say one thing before uh, you guys start answering this question. Um, and this is it. So my mother is a medical doctor who has never taught in her life. But as soon as the AI thing started happening, she said, oh, you know, AI is like, and I mean, she means ChatGPT, not AI in general, right? But ChatGPT is like fast food. I thought, oh my God, that is such a good analogy. That's such a good metaphor for AI because what comes to your mind when you think, oh, AI is like fast food? 
Um, and feel free to say in the chat if something comes to your mind. But the, the first thing that comes to my mind is, oh, it works faster than other kinds of food that are better for you, but it's not necessarily good for you. Um, and then sometimes when I say this metaphor, depending on the context, I say junk food instead of fast food and people get really upset. The ones who like AI a lot get really upset that I use junk food. And it's so interesting like that fast food is, is a more neutral term, but junk food is a negative connotation, like junk, right? Um, cheap calories, Ralph, good one. You could say processed food. Processed. Oh, processed food. That's interesting too. Oh, that's processed. a good one. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah, so that's even more neutral than fast, right? Yeah, but it's not neutral. My daughter likes it. She's giving you a, a, a thumbs up. It's still not neutral because it's um, but artificial rather than natural, right? And we know that, yeah. Not uh, Natasha is saying fast and easy. Yes, yeah, so, sorry, Barbara, say that again. I was saying it. it's not good for you any way you say it in that yeah. respect. Yeah, but the cheap calories thing is important in the sense that there are people who sometimes can't afford anything but that or... Yes. You get the calories, but you get nothing with them. But sometimes in a pinch, you need it, you know. Okay, so I so the other thing I want to say as I listen to your analogies is that I, uh, I'm co-authoring a paper on metaphors for AI and what they mean when we use certain metaphors, because certain metaphors uh, imply how we feel about them. It's, it reveals a lot about how we're feeling about it. And I think the metaphors I hear have been changing over the past few months. So Katie's saying she uses the food analogy too. And the digestive facts of quality versus non-quality foods. Yeah, thank you for that. So what other metaphors would you use? So that electronic quality, right? So it recognizes that it's digital. And then the, the collegiality element, sort of uh, what this new word that everyone's using now, anthropomorphic, yeah, that one that Joyce said, <laughs> making it more human. So calling it a newbie teaching assistant still kind of does that, right? Um, on-demand executive assistant, yeah. And so when you call it an executive assistant, you're you're saying it doesn't understand your expertise, but it helps you in ways that are different than colleague, right? So um, obviously your executive assistant is a colleague as well, but it's a different kind of colleague, right? And the TA is assuming it, it knows less than you, but it's still helping you. And Joyce is saying she cannot spell without her TA. That's interesting. Um, Sarah described it as a mirror. I've heard that one. And what I thought was very interesting is that I have a student who is visually impaired, and he understood the mirror metaphor and he talked about a distorted mirror. I was like, he's never seen a mirror in his life. He was born blind, but he understands the metaphor of the mirror. So that was interesting. It reflects back both what you asked, but also the biases that exist in training data. I love that element, Sarah. So it's not just reflecting me back. It's also reflecting back some stuff that we don't actually know exactly what training data it has, but it is reflecting that back, but also distorting it, I think. So not a, because mirrors usually say, show something exactly what it is. So it has to be like a bit of a distorting mirror. Um, making friends with it because it's not going away. Good point, Robert. Um, Joyce, in a candy store right now, worried about my addiction. I remember my addiction phase as well. I got over it. <laughs> but yeah, there is a phase of a sort of a being impressed and, and addicted a little bit. Uh, Pamela's talking about the TA metaphor. You have to tell it carefully what you want or you won't get anything useful. That's actually quite true. If I forget to tell my TA just one little thing, if I'm not explicit about it, yeah. Ooh, Bobby, I like the Jekyll and Hyde. I like that a lot. That is very interesting. And it does that. It, it turns on you sometimes and surprises you with something evil that you weren't expecting to see. Uh, Funhouse mirror, Laura. Yeah, that's kind of the distortion part, right? Um, and Ralph, interesting that mirrors reverse forward to backward. That's true. I haven't thought about how that would apply to the to the AI thing. Thank you all for sharing that. Um, it's always interesting for me when I ask this question to the students. And one of the things that I've been talking about this on Twitter, it would be interesting to see what metaphor they start the class with. And then after they learn about AI and they've used it for a whole semester, what metaphor they end the semester with and to be able to sort of compare and ask them to reflect on, oh, what does it mean that you started with this metaphor and now you ended with this metaphor? And of course, a lot of us are influenced by media and the kind of metaphors that are uh, used in media as well. Does anyone want to add anything before I move on to my next slide? Okay, I'll, I'll still keep an eye on the chat and show as I, as I go on. So, 
this one, how do you feel about the latest advances in AI? And feel free to also add sort of what you teach or what you do, because my main role in my institution is I'm a faculty developer. So my main job is to help other professors with their teaching. And I also teach a digital literacies course and we have a digital literacies toolkit in, in my department where we collect a lot of the digital literacies work that gets done in courses outside of my own. Um, so I teach, I teach about AI now. I mean, I teach it in my digital literacies course anyway, even before ChatGPT, right? Um, but I also teach our faculty what to do with new technology like ChatGPT. So uh, that's my role. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious how you all are feeling about it, right? Robert is excited and cautious. And it's, it's very important, I think, to be comfortable with having multiple emotions about it at the same time, to hold both excitement and caution, for example. Uh, Bobby's saying you, he's worried. Miami candidate from there already using it in his campaign. Oh, I'm curious how they're using it. Uh, Wendy's a librarian, instructional facilitator at pre-K to 12 school. Excited about how I can be used in education and curious about how I can get my faculty on board. Sarah, worried that the technology is moving more quickly than our conversations about what it is, how to use it, and potential drawbacks. Yeah, I think that's a legitimate worry that I think all of us have, uh, and especially those of us who then have to teach other people because we have to keep track to help them keep track and keep up, and you don't want to overwhelm people with too much. Uh, Joyce, the search tools and instructional design tools are getting better. Leslie, stranger at the door, you have to let in. That's a metaphor for it. That's a very interesting metaphor as well. Uh, Natasha's conflicted. You're teaching undergrads communication. Yes. Uh, Mariana, I'm worried about the fast growing AI consultants industry and the ed tech market selling AI as manager. Yes, I'm very always, I'm always very concerned about the tech discourses around these things that both scare us and try to impress us in ways that are manipulative and problematic, I yeah. think, and exaggerate definitely the pros and cons much more than they deserve to be, I think. Yeah. Um, Madhavi, I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Uh, curious and worried, I think. Nathan, great potential. Oh my God, I'm, my, my, I'm having trouble keeping track of the, of the chat now. And I can't scroll for some reason. Huh. Uh, I'm going to unshare my screen. That's going to be better. All right. <laughs> so I can focus on what y'all are saying. Um, great potential. Wonder if students have self control to use it properly, not shortchange their own learning and legitimate experience. I think, Nathan, what you're saying is something that a lot of us are concerned about, especially people who teach first level courses, definitely high school, but in middle school, because even in middle school, they use Cobot, right? Uh, I was recently in a session about AI where someone didn't know what Quobot is. So just in case someone doesn't know what Quobot is, it's a paraphrasing tool that has existed for quite some time and it's owned by Course Hero. So it's a really bad slippery slope into all the different ways to shortcut your, your learning. Um, but um, yeah, so Quobot has existed for a long time. And so some kids are using it and then maybe never learning to paraphrase and then never learning the value of reading a thing so you can paraphrase it. And so, of course, with ChatGPT, like taking that like on steroids, <laughs> writing the entire yeah. thing for them. So my daughter's next to me saying, that. <laughs> "Sorry, um, no, it's okay. You're here with us too. She's 12, but she's going on 18, so almost, almost." So Shelly uh, saying, "Excited, nervous, yet very curious of how to use it responsibly, teaching multimedia, see how it can be a tool that is integrated into our work and help others use a bit." Yeah, not sure of of Bilasha. Not sure, conflicted, teach journalism and communication. And I think legitimately conflicted, I would say. Uh, Joyce, image tools are being more concerned about open ownership, loving Adobe Firefly. Yeah, so the issue obviously with image generation tools is uh, copyright of the original data that they're getting from is, is problematic. Um, but they're also very interesting for those of us who aren't able to create those kinds of things on our own versus writing, which we tend to think most people are able to do. Uh, Yanti, interesting how the Hollywood strike helped explain the copyright issues of AI. That's a good point. So I'm hearing about the Hollywood strike, but I'm not keeping track, but definitely that's an issue, especially that I think there's quite a few shows that started using AI, right? Uh, Susan, oh, wow. uh, worried about it being used for misinformation. It's impact on media literacy. Yeah, misinformation on another level. Like <laughs> we have to re rethink how we teach misinformation at this point. Um, I remember when deep fakes started happening. So videos of people saying things that they never said. Uh, yeah, and, and now it's so much easier for these things to happen. So yeah, it's been happening a lot and even more so now. Uh, Leslie's a speech pathologist interested in media literacy for students. 
Bradley worried the students will learn to rely on it and then may not have access from what's DOD? I guess I'm guessing not AI systems, but I don't know what DOD yeah, stands for. Department, Department of Defense. Oh, Department of Defense. Oh, okay. All right. I see. Um, Mariana worried about algorithmic literacy is rapidly becoming a new source of digital divide. Yes. And so that's why this is important, right? To develop those literacies. Um, the SAD strike, yeah, what does it mean to be creative, right? And I don't think, I know there are people who are very good at making AI do really, really creative things, but it can only synthesize from data that's already seen, right? It can't create something completely, totally, totally, totally new. So I have, I just have a feeling that to be creative, you have to be a lot more creative to show the difference maybe, but I don't think it's, yeah, the end of anything. <laughs> um, Laura, folks in charge are worried about you. us regular folk now have access and how much money they will lose. Yeah, now they're access to the tools. Lib library media specialist in K-8 school. High school son feels angry that teachers can use it, but students can't. That's an important one. Yeah. I'm hoping that changes for him. Yeah, I think that's that's one of the things that I've heard students say. AI use as roses and thorns, Robert. I think, yeah, I think they're both together. Did we Let me switch to another? Hi. Oh, cool. The chat stayed. <laughs> All right. So I'm seeing people saying about being curious and maybe eerie because still new, lots of pushback. Um, excited, nervous, yet curious about how you use it responsibly. That's a great point. Confusing and scary. Synthesia has me concerned. That's the one that does video, right, Katie? Um, Pamela saying measure deja vu, every new technology over my career. <laughs> yeah, lots of hyperbole, I think, with that. Um, and Regina, confusing and scary when AI is applied to media like YouTube shorts or TikTok, I feel like we're trapped in vicious cycle of clicking and flowing through. Whose work lives will be destroyed? Bobby, that's an important question, of course. Um, and somebody posted the link to Quillbot. Thank you for that. This is something students have been using for a while. So uh, one, of, one of the funny things sometimes faculty say, I don't want to talk to students about AI. I don't want to give them ideas. And I'm like, they already have ideas. You just need to tell them what you're going to allow in your class because they're already using using it to an extent. So, um, and Pamela saying some jobs will be replaced. Same time, new jobs are being created. Yeah, the prompt engineer's job. I wonder for how long that's going to be a job, though, because I think a lot of people are learning prompt engineering, and then it's going to be just like when search engines came out and we figured out how to use them versus library databases versus searching the card catalog kind of thing. So I think it, it's going to become kind of maybe ubiquitous in that sense. All right, now, um, thank you all for sharing that. And, and we'll spend more time unpacking sort of what I mean when I say critical AI literacy, but I'm also curious what you're considering in your own teaching when you talk about maybe algorithmic or AI literacy. But before we do that, I wanna ask you guys, how many of you have ever played this game called Quick Draw? Does anyone know Quick Draw? Okay, cool. So I am going to put the link to Quick Draw. This is a game, it's not gonna teach you. So um, just to say, my I have a PhD in education, but my undergraduate degree was in computer science and my thesis was a neural network. So I understand exactly how machine learning generally works. Um, and there are different kinds, right? Some of them uh, relate to text and some relate to pattern recognition. So this is more of a pattern recognition, it's a visual AI. And basically Google created this to uh, learn from how humans doodle. And I'll tell you, this game is actually a way for Google to learn something that it later created another tool with. So I'm gonna share my screen and play it, but I encourage you to play it on your own. I'm just gonna share my screen and play it so that uh, people who are watching the recording can see it, but I also encourage them as they're watching to play it themselves. So basically Google is gonna tell me to draw something, to doodle something, and it's gonna try to guess as if it doesn't know what I'm drawing, all right? And it's going to tell me when oh, it figures gosh. out what it is. Oh, television is an easy. It's also used to. Used to be a girl. Compass. Um... <laughs> you see how it figured out before I even finished drawing it? What's a bottle cap? 
bottle cap. Like just the cap of a bottle, like just a like a cylinder. It it covers. It used to be. I don't think they make them anymore. You would remove it with a can opener, like Coke, Pepsi, a, a soda bottle. Um, soda bottle okay. would have it, it's metal. And ah, I it. see those. Yeah, I know and, those. And you could play Scully with it. We used ah, to play okay. a game. I see what you mean. I thought that was but, very interesting that that was a trick. This is a funny one. The goatee. Let's see if I can draw a goatee. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how am I going to put our boards? <laughs> Shovel. Does that look like this? Okay. So has anyone else managed to, to play it in the time that we've been? It's a lot easier to play on the phone. I forgot to say that because I have a touch screen, so it's easy to draw. Um, has anyone else had a ch chance? A bottle of Coke. Okay, that's what you're thinking about. All right. So anyone else had a chance to, to, to play with it? You want to tell us how that was for you? I didn't play it, but I don't have a cell phone. But I feel that it rather kind of stifles creativity in a way. If it's finishing mm -hmm. for you, it's not letting you think through the process or slog yeah. through the process to yeah. come to, you know, yeah to conclusion and process in creating is, you know, very important. So. One of the things that I think is really interesting about the TV is that TVs don't have antenna anymore. <laughs> like, I, I think my, my kid sees this. I don't know if she understands what those little lines are at the top, but that's how it, most are. people draw it. Yeah. So you see what this is? Mm. Most people draw it with an antenna. And so it just assumes if it's a box with these two lines, that that's gonna be a TV. And yeah. and the compass, I mean, I just put an end and a, an arrow, and that's, I mean, that's not a compass just because it has an end and an arrow, but that's what people start doing. So it starts recognizing, and then you don't even have to finish it. It becomes a stereotype, um, kind of. So, and it also assumes English, obviously, <laughs> I think. <laughs> so if there was a compass in some, but you can play this game in other languages, and it still expects very Western Anglo type of drawings. Um, predicated on drawing ability, I have none, but it isn't truly. Really. It's just predicated on doodling ability, so your ability to do things very quickly. Sometimes too fast to anticipate. You get used to it, I guess, because I played it a lot. My child loves playing it. She still loves playing it. We've been playing it for years now. Um, Pamela saying, imagine how helpful for nonverbal kids. That's a great point. It's guessing faster now that it has so much data. That's possible, Mariana. That's a good point. So. Um, and Shelly's saying very fast, though it was good because it made you made imagine what it looks like as you draw. Sometimes the process is more important than others, right? And so there are some things here that are interesting. These ones, the, the hexagon had guessed before I was done because I guess maybe most people draw it the same way. So just sort of expecting what I was going to do. What if you weren't going to do that? You know? Sorry, Barbara. I, I'm thinking of stops. I thought it was going to be a stop sign. Because that's, ah, that's a good shape. point. That's the shape of a stop. That's song. a very good point. That's a very good point. That could happen. So the goatee looks also like a necklace or just a beard. Because, yeah, what's the big difference between a goatee and a beard? Everyone else drew a face of a person. I didn't. Yeah, I just drew the bottom <laughs> part of the face. Um, but apparently, a lot of goatees look similar. So I sort of understood pretty quickly with that. What I think is interesting here is a couple of things uh, about just figuring out that. It, how it learns. So they don't teach this AI how these things work. They just get lots of data and it learns from the data of how people draw. And that's a lot of the ways a lot of the AIs work. But some of the things that happen is, for example, one of the words it sometimes asks is a nail. And when you hear about nail, mm -hmm. that could be actually two completely different things, right? Could be the nail that you hit with a hammer. It could be like a fingernail or a toenail. Yeah. It understands both because probably half the people do this or that. Sometimes it asks about a bat and a bat could be like a baseball bat. It could be the bat, the animal that flies, right? So those things it knows, but there are other things that it has a very Eurocentric, Anglo-centric perspective on. So for example, hospital, it expects to see a cross, but in the Muslim world, we have a, um, a crescent, not a cross. And in Israel, I think they have a David star, for example. Um, it expects you to draw an angel, even in Arabic. And actually, in Islam, we're not supposed to draw angels at all. We're not supposed to depict them visually. So it expects you know, the halo and the wings, and, and that's what most people will draw. And so that's what it expects. 
the end result of this uh, tool is that Google uses it to create this other tool, which is a really useful tool. So it's called AutoDraw. And I'm having trouble connecting to it, but let's see if it works if I try it. Yeah. It's a little bit slow right now. So what auto draw is, is that, yeah, it's not working, um, but you can try it later. It's the first time I, it doesn't work for me. One more time. Is that you are, I'm trying to draw a beautiful flower, for example, but I'm not good at drawing. So a lot of people here were saying, oh, I'm not good at drawing. What you'll do is you'll try to doodle a flower and then it will show you lots of better quality pictures of flowers based on what you drew. Or you'll try to draw a guitar and it'll, try, it'll give you lots of options for better quality guitars. So they basically use the data from Quick Draw about how people doodle badly in 30 <laughs> seconds or 10 seconds or whatever amount of time. I think it's 10 seconds um, into this tool that does allow you to create very neat icons and images by trying to draw it yourself. And you can do all kinds of, yes, that's the link. It's for some reason not working for me, but there is a lack of cultural diversity in the images. Yeah. Exactly, Mariana. And I think that's um, that's sort of the analogy I want to draw, you know, I want to compare this with what we have with the language learning models. So I usually so show quick draw to my students um, early on in the semester when we're talking about AI, just so that they sort of understand this the concept of machines learning from data given to them and figuring out the patterns on them. So I'm gonna put a link to the chat in the chat now to some other things as I go. I'm going to start building my what I what I would consider the most important elements of AI literacy, um, and share some of the ways I teach them. Oh, Linda Berry, I love Linda Berry. She has a book making comics teaches cartooning without approval by AI. <laughs> okay, definitely. Um, so this link that I put in the chat should be a link to a paper where students share their perspectives on AI literacy, and some of the things they say are these. Um, I don't know if anyone's seen that paper, sorry. So some of them have said that they feel like it helps them overcome writer's block, which I think is true, but also problematic because Sorry. in what direction are they overcoming writer's block? Possibly in a very specific direction based on the kind of data it's been trained on and maybe not in more creative directions and that marginalized groups would go if they were able to, to do it on their own. Um, Students are saying they could use it to modify text, summarize readings, or assist with writing, which I know some of them do, and that can be useful. Uh, but we're also worried about like, how is it going about summarizing the readings? And do students need to learn these skills themselves? But also, do we give students enough time? Uh, some people are using it to translate. Again, translation has existed for a long time. It's been using AI for a long time, and we know it's problematic, but it's still useful because there are some languages that we can't learn all the languages, right? But then are there, what kind of nuances are we losing when we use AI for translation? And what kind of harm can be caused by misunderstandings of really important things? Uh, and some people use it as a tutor, which I find really problematic given that it's actually hallucinates and makes things up all the time. So if it's gonna work with a student one-on-one -on -one as a writing tutor or to help them with, um, with actual content, I know people have used it this way. I'm, I'm still kind of, I'm worried about this. I don't know if any of you have done that, this thing of telling it, act as my tutor of psychology or act as my whatever, um, and let it ask you and answer questions and give feedback. It does it, but if it was doing it on a topic that I don't know anything about, I wouldn't know if it's being accurate. And then others are like, well, we use it to edit our writing to just serve as a more comprehensive alternative to current editing instead of like spell check and Grammarly. And actually Grammarly itself, apparently the paid version is really, really advanced right now and does a lot of writing. Um, so. But like others have said, the training data that it's gotten and the way AI in general, before even ChatGPT, we know that AI has been racist and ableist and sexist. It's got assumptions in it and large language models like ChatGPT is built on that. If it's using data from the internet, the internet itself is racist and sexist and ableist and very Western oriented, very male Western oriented. So um, there's, there's, there's all these things hidden in all kinds of AI. We know that AI that has been used for proctoring has been racist and ableist. We know that other types of AI in the criminal justice system have been racist and problematic. So this chat GPT is similar in that sense. It's got some things built into it to make it a little bit better, but, um, but it's still got problems. And we'll talk a little bit more about chat GPT and similar AI. 
Um, but one of the things that I think a lot of us are thinking about is how do assessments need to be happening? Um, sustainable assessment is maybe one thing to focus on rather than content, but to focus on the processes of learning so the students can see what the value of the process of learning is versus the content that we take from them, which ChatGPT can sometimes create, not necessarily with the best quality, but to them, they don't have yet the judgment sometimes to know. Uh, Wendy is asking about, are you going to be a tutor? Saw a, a video by Selhan from Khan Academy about how they're working to harness Power AI to provide differentiated tutoring. I don't know how they would do it with Khan Academy exactly. And I don't know if it would be exactly the same as just using ChatGPT in a pure form. Um, I think if you include it with data that's a little bit of taught by the teachers and then a little bit of AI to help with that, it's a very different type of AI than the AI that's just pure ChatGPT that's got no knowledge about anything in particular. It's very generic. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then what Pamela is saying, why can't we have an AI where we curate the data set, right? Like, why can't we have a psychology 101 AI where we feed it all the textbooks on psychology and then it works with that rather than it just does general stuff and it might find like junk science and bring that in because it has no way of evaluating the quality of the content that they've got that it's, that it's using, right? It's, I, I want you to start thinking about what you would include when you're teaching AI literacies to your students or developing your own AI literacies, because I'm sure there are a lot of people here who have a lot of um, ideas about this as I say mine, and let me know if you think that I'm missing some. So, you know, if we think about um, AI literacies, there's um, this article that I'm referring to here where they've got the four aspects of AI literacy, just knowing it and understanding it, using and applying it, evaluating and creating, and then there are ethical issues. and. I've got my sort of model where I have understanding how it works, um, understanding that you know machine learning and neural network type of AIs aren't given specific direction. The algorithm works in a very different way that even the programmer doesn't exactly understand how it's learning, but to understand the concept of it learning from data that it's gotten and making its own connections that we don't understand how it makes and then producing these outputs that it thinks probabilistically is probably what you would have wanted it to say. Um, but it's important to know, understand about the biases in the data that it's getting in. And sort of because of that, the kind of biases in whatever it produces out. It's important to be aware of inequalities. And inequalities here are many. Some of them is just access to even uh, good internet and the digital technology. And I don't know if you guys know, but there are some countries in the world, including Egypt and Saudi Arabia, and I think Hong Kong, that don't have access to ChatGPT. So if you try to create a ChatGPT account from Egypt, it tells you this is this software is not available in your country. This is not a problem with my country. This is the con the country the company OpenAI has decided for some reason that nobody understands that Egypt and Saudi Arabia and certain countries won't have access to ChatGPT. So even the free version, but I access it through VPN. I access it through a phone number of a friend of mine in the U.S. to to be able to create the account but not everyone has those kind of contacts and that kind of digital literacy to be able to do that. There are now a lot of other options other than ChatGPT that have something similar. So now more people have access to a lot of different things, but at a certain point, people didn't have access to it at all. Um, and then there, there are the issues of how ChatGPT was trying to make sure that its AI doesn't, uh, it learned from previous AIs, right? It, that its AI doesn't produce like swear words and violence and things like that. But in order to train it to do that, uh, do you guys know that they outsourced to uh, a company in, in, in Africa, in Kenya especially, where the workers had to wade through a lot of internet data that was very traumatic, both visual and written, in order to filter it out so that we don't get to see the ugliness. And so these people were, first of all, very badly paid, but more importantly, they've suffered mental health issues because of that process. And then ChatGPT didn't do, OpenAI as a company didn't do anything to, to help them through that. So that was a problematic thing. And it's, I think it's important for us to know these things um, and what kind of harm has been created in the process. There's also a, the climate impact of these large, large language models and the amount of data they use in the process. And so that's also that impact on the environment is something that isn't really transparent and we don't expect that technology has that kind of impact. So it's important to uh, include that. Hope the EU has the skill to rein in potential dangers as a model for the US. Yeah, the EU is always ahead of the US in these things, right? 
Uh, Pam was talking about dispelling myths, unlearn the wrong information. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, invisible labor of content moderation. Sorry. I remember my daughter when she heard this, she's like, I wish I didn't know that. And I said, do you wish you didn't know it? Do you wish it didn't happen? <laughs> because it did happen. And now what are we going to do about it? And one of the things I started doing when I found this out is like, I really use ChatGPT minimally. Like I try to use less of it. At some point she said, oh, can we use other AIs? I'm like, a lot of them are still built on the same GPT technology. So just using another AI doesn't necessarily mean it's not um, built on the same technology. But I think as with things that a lot of you have said earlier when you were talking about how you feel about it, there's two things that I think we can and should be possibly teaching students at some point in high school maybe and in higher education is for them to understand when, why, and where AI does help. So I think it's gonna be difficult to say don't use it at all. And I think in the future in a lot of jobs and, and so on, it will be used, but it's about figuring out which thing it's gonna help me with and which thing is gonna be problematic to use it in and also prompt engineering. So when you are gonna use it, how do you use it well? How do you get the most out of it? And how do you make it do better at what it is capable of doing so that you get the best out of it that you can? And, and those things come with time and experience and um, I will just put a link to uh, the blog post that I wrote um, on the critical AI literacy topic that this, I just made this infographic out of it, but it was, uh, it tells a little bit more and it pro provides more resources about this. So I, I do think it's important to recognize inequity in AI globally, like who has access to it, whose data was used to train it. Um, and also the fact that it can reproduce oppression because of all of those other things, uh, the data that's been used. And it's also extractive. It's learning from users and taking data without permission and taking uh, the, the work of people without their permission, without uh, attributing them. So for example, I don't know if you guys know, but there's, there's, a, there's a really good article on what white supremacy culture looks like. And if you ask ChatGPT, what is white supremacy culture? What does it look like? Or what are the elements of white supremacy culture? It will list them. And I will say, where did you get this from? And of course it will tell me, I'm an AI model. I have no idea where I got my data from. But then if you ask it another question, who is a well-known author about white supremacy culture? It will tell you, Tema Oken, right? But it will never say that when it's giving you the list of things. So whenever people say, you know, I'm thinking with my students, telling them be transparent about how you use AI. And some people say, oh, well, like, that's a hassle. Like, there's no point. It'll just become like hybrid writing. But there, these are actually the ideas of this person, Tema Oken, that the AI is just replicating without referencing. And then students will never know who Tema Oken is or, or what the rest of her work is, or also what kind of critiques she has over her own work. And they just use this coming out of the AI and present it as their own work. And it's, it becomes kind of really problematic uh, with, with those layers of, of um, recognition of where where ideas come from and where work comes from um the other issue though is and i think a lot of us have been discussing this is the problem with the ai detectors right so a lot of people are like oh well now they're ai they were always ai detectors like very early on but the text is not reliable right so it's not the idea of like trying to catch people for using ai we can't do that very well right now. And that shouldn't be the direction we go. It's not about stopping people or catching people. But the thing that's actually worse, which I found out in this paper is they're especially unreliable when the real author, a human, is not a native speaker of English. And I think possibly it's because non-native speakers may be learning formulaic ways of writing. And so their writing tends to sound like AI. And I will tell you as an Egyptian, the majority of that when I saw the writing coming out of ChatGPT, I was like, this sounds like my B minus students. That's how they write. So, so there's this linguistic diversity problem that it will produce writing in a very particular way. And people who don't have confidence in their own writing will think that this is what good writing is. They won't be able to tell that they could write more creatively, that they could have their own voice. And this is a concern for me that people tend to start to think that, oh, maybe I need to sound more like a native speaker. Um, and there's also, I don't know if you guys know about this, but there's also AI that will take your spoken English and do it back for you with your voice, but with a more native sounding accent. 
And so that again is just promoting native speakerism in ways that I think are particularly important. Um, I keep asking questions or making comments in the chat as we go. I'm gonna rush through this last part, um, but this is uh, Brenna Clark Gray, who's brilliant. And she's talking about, we've been training learners to write like robots following patterns and scripts. And so of course, robots are also good at that. Okay. So sometimes the reason robots are as good as, we, as students is because we teach students to write this way. Um, this, this was an interesting UNESCO document, uh, like a quick start guide to chat GPT which I thought was interesting because, um, I mean, it's a very obvious thing. So it starts like, does it really matter if the output is true? And if it doesn't matter if the output is true, go ahead and use ChatGPT. But if it does matter is true, you know, do you have the expertise to verify the output's accurate? And if you don't, maybe don't use it, which is most of our students, right? <laughs> and if you do have the expertise, are you willing to take responsibility then maybe it's possible to use it? Now, but there are situations uh, and I, I remember my daughter, like two weeks after using AI, she's like, if I wanted something credible, I'd Google it because then I know what the source is. So I think any of our students who have basic information literacy should be able to um, figure this out on their own. But I'm curious, when are situations where it doesn't matter if the output is true? Because I think there are situations where whether the output is true or not important. Um, and so these are the ones maybe where we could encourage students to use something like ChatGPT. So I'm curious, what do you guys think? What are some situations where it doesn't matter if the output is true? Googling it is also a problem, yes, because Google is also biased, but at least it sends you to a link and then you can open the link and figure out if the link is credible. But of course, what it puts in the first page is, is biased already. Uh, Wendy's saying ChatGPT to help me find creative catchy names for courses or activities. Yeah, I use it for that. Like renaming a workshop or renaming a blurb. Like I give it a blurb and say, say it in a more exciting way, you know? And then I can edit it, right? Fiction writing, definitely. And it's not even that creative with fiction writing, but you can keep prompting it to be more creative. Generating and remixing ideas, Natasha, I agree. Opinion and critique is not yeah, necessarily factual. Q and <laughs> Okay, Ralph, I get you. Um, Mariana, brainstorming, remixing, creating topic structure, generating questions. Yeah. Uh, Jocelyn, when it's creative play, just learning what's possible, not doing hard research. Yeah. Padida is saying brainstorm. Yeah. And Robert for st structural issues, rephrasing, brainstorming. Yeah. And there are, of course, other AIs other than ChatGPT. Like if you use Bing inside the browser, it can read what's there and summarize it or do things like that. There are other AIs that don't create things from scratch. They actually get real sources like Omni. There's one called Omni. I'm just gonna put, um, I can't remember if it's AI.ai or .io, but that one's, um, that uses real sources and it's unlike ChatGPT. It real, uses real sources and then it summarizes them. There's also one called Typeset, again, .ai or .io. Generating an outline of notes. Yeah, it tends to do that okay. So I'm all right with it using that. Exactly, and so, those are some ways that it can be used that way. Um, I also don't know if you guys have seen Sarah Elaine Eaton uh, talking about what she calls a post-plagiarism era, thinking that just trying to determine where the human ends and where the artificial intelligence begins is gonna become, when she's talking about the future, right? Becoming pointless and futile. I don't know if we're there yet and I, I'm concerned about that, but she's thinking that's what's gonna happen and that our definitions of plagiarism will be rewritten not just rewritten, but also transcended, and that our policies and universities and so on will have to adapt. She's got a lot of things. Um, I'm going to put a link to her uh, her blog post here and my response to her blog post as well, because I think there's some elements of hers that I don't agree with. She does say that attribution still remains important, which is important for me. She talks about language barriers disappearing, which I don't think is going to happen. Prompt writing, definitely a fast growing uh, profession, I think, Robert. But there are also a lot of these courses. There's a Vanderbilt Coursera course that just started recently about prompt engineering. There are LinkedIn courses. There's a lot of courses on prompt engineering. And I don't know if it's gonna become something that uh, not everyone can do. I think it might be something that everyone can learn. Uh, Mariana is amazed at how many people are teaching pre-content generation stuff like prompt strategy, but not post-generation like questioning. That's so important. I think I, you're right. It's What's more important is once the chat GPT gives you stuff, like how are you going to question and analyze and verify what it gave you? Right? Encouraging transparency in syllabus statements is definitely something that I started talking about very early on about this. 
with the knowledge that students have to trust you in order to be transparent with you about these things, because there will be other professors who discourage them from using it altogether. Okay. I let students play games like Quick Draw, but there are also a couple more. There's real or fake tests and real, real or fake photos. You know, there's a whole website called This Face. This person does not exist. That's full of photos of people don't exist. And this one is for you to guess which person is real and which one is not. The other thing that I try to talk to students about is about automation of care and that we shouldn't be automating what we care about. It's okay to automate the things that we don't care about, but don't automate the stuff you care about that's important, that has emotional impact. Um, I do think that institutional support needs sort of community conversations um, and that we need to support learners' critical eye literacy rather than catch and punish, and that we need to address the inequalities and that never automating what we care about. I'm going to skip over these, but I'll, maybe I'll give you this link to this article that has speculative fiction about AI. Like what, what, what would AI in the future be in education? It's got positive and negative speculative fiction on this, so that's worth looking at. Um, and I want to stop here and see if folks here have, I was gonna send you to breakout rooms to talk about um, you know, what you're thinking about in terms of promoting uh, AI literacies in your courses, but I think maybe we can stay here and talk about it. What do you guys think? Stay here and talk about sort of ideas you've got in your mind or questions you have. Mariana put a collection of, yeah, curating AI ethics and social justice. Thank you so much for that. So yeah, the Mar slides are here. Yeah, uh, Marco, Marco, what about the children that are in the elementary school? How, mm -hmm. it's it, from, from my perspective, it's critical that they learn how to think for themselves yeah. before and, and know themselves, which they're not really going to do until they get, you know, along yeah. in life. So yes. how do we still give them that space to yeah. grow and develop great, and participate in their own development without, yeah. as that's my expression, yeah. being, being told you know, from a robotic, so to speak, mechanism. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. also like the television, the commercials. Years ago, <laughs> I used to say to my son, don't come and tell me what adults tell you that they need. They're really basically only interested in your money. Go go participate mm -hmm. in your own development. Go right. play with the block. Right. Right. So, so this is this is one of the spaces where the the calculator metaphor is not very accurate, but it's a good one in terms of education. Like you don't let people use a calculator before they can do the basic um, addition and subtraction on their own first because they won't be able to use it well. I think it's the same with uh, with AI that does writing is if you don't know how to write, you won't know how to ask it a good question. You won't be able to get a good output out of it. But I think also one of the things that I've noticed happens when I show students the problems with it is that they start to realize that it's not credible when they ask it questions that are very connected to their own culture or they're very specific and they start seeing the kind of outputs it produces they start to see so you know at whatever age they are to whatever level of understanding they're capable of to to show them why what they let them do it themselves let the ai do it let them see the difference um you know help them figure out those little things and focus on the process i think of learning the other thing is really, if they're doing something they enjoy, that they care about, they won't be tempted to use AI or when they use AI, they'll use a little bit, but they won't use the big thing. So for example, if you if they go and have an experience where they go out into, the, into a garden and they do something with the flowers or whatever, to come back and write about it, how's the AI gonna write about their experience for them? <laughs> That's not possible, right? They'd have to tell it a lot of information for it to be able to write about it. And by then they've written the prompt itself was the writing assignment, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. so maybe the writing assignments become the writing, the write a good prompt for AI to do this for you. But I mean, so the more we, we, we have, the learning itself is never gonna be the AI. The learning itself is something else that's happening, you know? But in order for them to learn to write, that's also, uh, they have to be able to to write about something they want to write about so that they want to write it. And to me, that that motivation is a huge element of it. But but the the thing that's working with my students who are the, sophomores, juniors in, in college, and I know that's not the same as elementary, of course, mm -hmm. but it's when they realize the limitations of it. And it's getting better, but it will always have limitations. And it will never be able to relay your own experience back to you. Uh, it will the, it will write generic things. So we need to ask stop asking students to write generic things. Right. And the emotions are not going to be there. You know, yeah, exactly. 
it, that's exactly. missing. So exactly. the flower garden. Have you been seeing? Have you been seeing the emails written by students using AI? I, and I, how inauthentic they sound? They're like so formal, but so well written and so like well argued. I'm like, these aren't students. And then I asked my students, are you guys using AI? And they're like, yeah, yeah, we use Grammarly and Quillbot and then we put it through ChatGPT. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, they use a cocktail of AI. So the flower garden is a very good, uh, that's a good um, analogy and a good, you know, texture and colors and all of that, you know, the yeah. smell. AI. I had, I had, um, I, I think I posted on Twitter is like, if you think about writing as a, making a cake, when is it okay to buy a cake that's ready made from a store? When is it okay to buy like Twinkies that are all the same? And when do you really need to make it from scratch? And when is it okay maybe to get a Betty Crocker box? And, and so you have some parts of it ready-made, but then you do the rest. And it depends on what you're teaching, right? Am I teaching baking? Or am I teaching cake decorating? So it's okay to use Betty Crocker because I'm just going to decorate it. So like people who teach writing in the first year are in a very different place than people who are teaching whatever, engineering in the fourth year. Because with the engineering, the actual work was the engineering. Writing about it is not the point. Though. They're just writing about what they did. So they have to do the work. Yeah. But, but a homemade cake to get to learn how to like a homemade cake or a, a bread from bread from yeah. a, from a bakery as opposed yeah. to from the package in a store. Yeah. You, you need to have that taste in your mouth, in your heart, True. you True. know. So and your first that. cake might not be very good. No. And that's <laughs> the thing. The students see the cake coming from the store box, whether it's even from the supermarket or from a bakery. And they think, oh, I can't make anything that good. So the one that's store-bought from like a bakery is like when you get someone else to do the work for you or you pay someone to do it for you, right? But the the one that's, I think like the AI is kind of like the Twinkie because it's really bland, <laughs> bland and it's different every time, but it's bland. It doesn't have your personality in it. It doesn't have what you can add to it, but it's consistent. Whereas doing it on your own, if you don't feel capable and we need to help them we need to give them authorized support so they don't use unauthorized support, I think, whether it's a TA or us or whatever other sources of support. Um, so and to so risk and to risk it, you need to, have, to risk it. be yeah. but you need that support from a parent yeah. or you know yeah. a, a mentor, somebody to give you that. Yes. So yes. you risk yes. and you'll try again because yeah. you yeah. know if if you know you you've done it and that's to your credit and it'll get better especially yeah. if you have someone yeah. to work Joyce uh, with. Joyce Valenza is that a hand up uh, you know I I don't know that I agree about okay. the cake analogy okay so don't we're recording but don't tell anybody this <laughs> so I was struggling with writing a, a tribute to a colleague who was retiring mm -hmm. and whatever I wrote just didn't feel right Mm -hmm. And it was just a paragraph. And what I did was I wrote what I felt. And then I went through several iterations. I went to Bard and I went to Bing and then I went to chat GPT. What, what I, the way my brain works, and I suspect I'm not alone, is I need some dots to connect. I need mm -hmm. some new ways. I needed a new way of saying cutting through the crap. Because this mm -hmm. is what this man did on a regular yeah. basis. Yeah. I couldn't think, forgive me, young lady who's sitting next to you, for my language. <laughs> I could not think of a right way to say it. Among the three things that I checked, the patterns that I needed were connected. And it allowed me to be the conductor of yeah. those three tools that I, I used. And what I just produced was heartfelt and lovely. And I these things are getting better chat gpt4 is far better uh mm -hmm. bard and, and bing give me choices and i can refine the choices that i make yes. um brainstorming yes robert um you know i and i keep saying we are not even looking at the new search tools that are emerging that are actually making connections in ideas not based yeah. on metadata but based on content and, and the combination of metadata search terms, content, and whatever predictions the algorithms are making, in addition to the stuff we already had, 
mm -hmm. are phenomenal. Um, and I would not dismiss this, but I will, you know, in terms of the really powerful things this is doing, um, yeah. Will Richardson had a really interesting blog post today about dangers. And I, I, I thought his ideas were brilliant, but there has to be some middle ground here about how we're going to use and adapt these tools and create cultures of honesty and acknowledge these things are going to be used in real life to describe the garden visit that we had. Mm -hmm. How do we make the work ours? What does it mean to be a creative as we face the next 10 years? I don't, this, the genie is absolutely out of the bottle. You're not going to stop me from making use of these tools mm -hmm. that have helped yeah. me be a better writer. And yeah. I'm saying this honestly, I am a better writer because of these tools right now, because yeah. I'm not stuck in, in the limits of my brain. I'm seeing new patterns. Yeah, but what you're saying, Joyce, I'm agreeing with everything you said, because I use AI when I'm stuck on something and I use the different ones. I don't like Bard very much, but I like Bing and the chat GPT. And I like pseudo right? If you've never tried yeah. that one, it's yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I've tried, I have, I'll put my, my, my yeah. petting in there. Yeah. And, and, but what happened here is because you're already a good writer, you already had your idea. It wasn't giving you the idea of what you were gonna write but you were, it was helping you paraphrase and that's the tweaking part. And that's, I, and, and, and the writer's block part, it does help with that, but you already have the basic skill and that's why you're able to use it very well. I think what happens with students is they don't have an idea what they wanna write about at all sometimes. And they just give it not necessarily a very good prompt. And I'm saying a very good prompt is in itself an act of writing. And so perhaps what they learn to write is how to write a good writing prompt. One of the other, um, I know there are two hands up. Uh, we're, we're at time, but I can say about like 10 more minutes and, and I'll take those two questions and comments. But the other thing is also someone was telling me, oh, maybe we don't need to let them do a literature review anymore. And it's not that, not literature review, I mean like the annotated bibliography, because there's so many tools that can do that now. And I'm like, true. So maybe it creates the annotated bibliography for a lot of sources for them. Then they decide which articles they want to read. Then what they give us is not a generic annotated bibliography anymore, but sort of how I'm going to use this in my research, why this is relevant to my research, not just what's this article about. And then it just becomes a different type of thing that they do because some of it can be done for them. Right. But, Lit reviews um, have been facilitated. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. So I'm not disagreeing with anything you've said, actually. <laughs> Joyce. All right. Uh, Sarah and then Marianne. Go ahead, Sarah. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to build on something that um, Joyce had been saying about using these these tools. And um, my I'm a librarian, and my first um, six years in a library work at a school for students with various learning disabilities, mostly, um, and a lot of them around expressive language and that task initiation part. Like everything we've we were learning about executive functions and that like that trouble of getting started. Um, and I hadn't really thought about this, like as someone who often finds it easier to revise than to write the first draft, um, the ways this can be useful for students or adults with any sort of like attention or executive function challenges as that way to get started. Um, and like I said, you still have to know what you wanna say. You still have to have the ideas, um, but it is that that support. And I think there are so many things that make me nervous about AI and increasing inequalities, but I'm wondering if this is a way in which it could help level the playing field in some ways. I, I have heard this uh, before, and I don't know how much research has been done, but I have heard that for some it has helped them and for some it confuses them uh, more. But definitely yeah. that's another that's another thing to think about is like if we're not able to provide that support and AI is providing that support um, and helping people get started or helping them finish, right? Because people have struggled with different elements of that. So thank you for that contribution, Sarah. I agree. Mariana? Oh, you're on mute. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, being too polite. Um, I just <laughs> wanted to um, take it from what Joyce was saying, how she generated three different uh, notes on different tools. And I also think that we need to start uh, paying a little bit more attention about the affordances of the various tools um, and how they change, you know, they reflect back to us and end up changing the way we work. Um, and so it's not a one way thing. 
Um, and that's a really interesting thing to talk about and, and not related to AI, but I recently, just very recently started using Obsidian for note-taking, which I had never had before. And it's really amazing how it's changed my way of connecting ideas and, and, and thinking and organizing research. Um, and I don't know, it's just, it's changed the way I think it works. So it's just another angle to look at, you know, I, and especially because it needs to be seen as a two-way street. Mm -hmm. You reminded me of something interesting. And it's very important because our relationships with technology is entangled. It's not just that they act on us or that we act on them. It's it's we act on them, they act on us, and they influence the way we think and the way we do things. You reminded me of when I was doing my PhD and I discovered Mendeley, which is a reference management system and also allows you to take notes. And that, oh, an article could have more than one tag. It didn't have to belong to just one folder in my computer. And I was like, yes, where have you been all my life? Because I'd have to put the same article in different places, which was silly because it's just one article that has lots of time. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, but yeah, there are a lot of ways in which um, tools would influence the way we go about things. So, but I think then also when when learners who are still early in their careers are are learning to use these things, how is it influencing the way they think about writing? Is it leading them to think about writing in particular ways that are limiting the possibilities for them? to just the possibilities of the majority of the data that ChatGPT has. So someone talked about asking AI about whether media literacy and info literacy should be merged or something like that. This is something that probably a lot of people have talked about before and that's why ChatGPT can do it. That um, professor from who said it can do an MBA is because he asked it a question that's been asked so many times before. It's been answered so many times on Course Hero that it has seen a correct answer for this question and it's seen incorrect answers for it. So the possibility that it can answer it is high. But if we're asking very unique and new things, uh, then it'll be able to do parts of it if we break it down kind of the way Joyce did, rather than giving it like pure things. And then as we learn how to make the most of what it can give us, uh, and then we teach students how to do that, or students learn maybe faster than we do, it depends. But then I think the aspect of what do you do with what comes out of it, because Joyce, you were also talking about what do you do with the output? It's not just about uh, giving it a good prompt, but also when it gives you something out, how are you synthesizing? How are you choosing which one? And do you know what Bing is better at than ChatGPT, for example? So like Bing produces usually real references versus ChatGPT, which doesn't, but I think there's a plugin to ChatGPT4, to GPT4 that would produce real references and figuring out which tool is good at what and when to use it and which step in the research process or in whatever process we're doing. It's going to actually produce something that will save me time and maybe do it better than if I had to search and read 10 different articles to find it. Pamela, were you going to say something? Yeah. Oh, me? You look like you want to say something. What you just said, I mean, uh, is there a a place out there like that has uh, annotated information about different AI tools uh, like they're they're there is one for other other tools on one of the mm. sites, but you know, it'd be great to have like a wiki that was about AI tools for educational use. You have this one is free, this one is good at this, this one yeah. has these faults. I mean, that would there be are nice. loads of them. I'm going to share a link to some oh, of these. Yeah. yeah, there's an AI in education Google group where they've been sharing some of these things recently. Is that the one you're talking about, Joyce? Yeah. There, yeah, that's brilliant. Um, I, I have a list of them here. I'm going to paste uh, the link here. Thank you. And Jocelyn, are you? I'm going to save the chat, but is is the because when you do the recording, I don't know if the the chat it will be recorded on the Zoom Cloud if you're doing that. But yeah, I'll right. see. Thank you for that list, Joyce. So I know we're six minutes above time. I can still wait like four more minutes, but whoever's here, could you just let me want to know one of your key takeaways in the in the chat? And I can still stay for like a couple more minutes. But thank you everyone for coming and for your patience with my tech issue. I love this conversation. Thank you. Thank you.
people are saying interesting things about, you know, note taking, the value of note taking and summarizing. And so what happens when someone else does that for you? Um, Yeah. As rich as these recordings always are, the chat is equally as rich. So we'll definitely always. be seeing that. And I know we're we're losing a few folks as we go over time. So just a quick announcement that this series will be taking a very short summer break over the next month, but we are coming back in September with Joyce, who's going to lead us into the fall semester with a bunch of really great resources and a really hands-on session. So I hope to see you all there and we'll be doing some publication around that very soon forward to that session thank you thank you maha this is really important. very thought-provoking wonderful thank, thank you, you everyone.